all right guys yeah thank you guys and um welcome everybody um please um do not forget to tweet about this room um so that we can start this conversation um it's it promises to be a wonderful session um where we're going to be talking about you know um africa um 130 years after the berlin conference what has happened to us um and then you know we're going to talk about where africa is at this moment and then what is the future of Africa, if there is any, under this Berlin conference um, created systems. Um, so, Areko um, over to you. Um, thank you very much, everybody. We greet you all in the name of Olodumare. We welcome you into this fantastic today in the name of our ancestors. I welcome the entire Yoruba people I welcome all the indigenous people across Africa that are listening to me this evening. Today, we are going to have like a mini conference, a mini summit, and a mini dialogue, and a mini intellectual discourse about an event that has shaped our reality and our destiny for 100, more than 100 years old event that has changed our identity, that has changed our beings, that has changed who we are, that has changed who we aspire to be, and that has changed our spiritual being as a people. On November 15, 1884, 138 years old, 138 years ago, a conference started in Berlin, which was cheered by a high on wheeled, strong statesman who created the modern German state in the name of Otto von Bismarck. It was in that conference that me and you became Nigerians. Other people became Liberians. Other people became Sileolonians. Other people became Tanzanians. Other people became Ghanaians. Other people became Togolese. Other people became Sileolonians. Other people became Madagascans. Other people became Algerians. It was in this, conf it was in this conference, our faith was sealed and the borders of Africa was erected. It was in this conference that brothers became foreigners, brothers became enemies, brothers became outsiders to themselves, and strangers are forced to call themselves countrymen. It was in this conference neocolonialism was instituted, colonialism was instituted, Ivory slavery was instituted and Africa was put under lock and key. It happened 138 years ago. The question I'm asking everybody listening to me today, why is it that nobody remembers the Berlin Conference and remember November 15? Which African organization, which African group, which Pan-African organization even have, have the will to talk about the Berlin West African Conference. Because after 188, 38 years of indoctrination, the Africans who themselves have been the biggest victim of the Berlin West African Conference, they themselves have been weaponized, manipulated, rigmaroled, brainwashed, reprogrammed, to even defend that colonial borders with their lives. This is why we are here and we thank Olodumare for giving the Think Yoruba Force the wisdom, the fortitude, the, the, the grace, and the strength to continue to move on. Despite the fact that we are surrounded by booby traps, firstly by our fellow kinsmen, we want to maintain the colonial borders of the European slave masters and also by other ethnicities 
whose worldview have been corrupted by the Europeans after 138 years. Without wasting much of our time, I'll do a little summary of the pre-events in maybe five to six minutes, or maybe 10 minutes, before talking about what happened in the 1884 Berlin West African Conference that was held in Germany. And after this, we are going to talk about the results and effect of that Berlin West African Conference. And the last point is, what is the way forward? Africa needs to have, indigenous people of Africa needs to have a very, very sincere conversation with themselves. Intellectuals need to sit down and have a very intellectual discussions with themselves. But unfortunately, we live in an age where influencers who do now, who, 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 people who cannot even talk about the history of Mungo Park have become authorities on talking about the affairs of thousands of civilizations that are banned on the African continent. We live in a age of sheer ignorance and arrogance. And this, if not well taken care of, we mean that indigenous people in Africa might, be, might go extinct in the next one or two century. You can go extinct, not because you don't know your genetic pool no longer exists. You can go extinct when you have been assimilated into a foreign identity. You can go extinct when you do not have sovereignty across your ancestral space. You can go extinct when Adebayo is turned into Washington and when Adenero is transformed into Abu Gaba. You can go extinct when, you, when your language, when Yoruba language is supplanted with Arabic language. You can go extinct when Yoruba language is replaced with English language. You can go extinct when you become westernized instead of becoming urbanized. You can go extinct when you become anglicized instead of becoming fully urbanized. There are different ways you can which you can go extinct. Just look at our brothers. Look at our brothers across the, across across the Atlantic in the Americas. Let's look at them and tell me if they still have any form of African identity. That is why we need to understand that what makes us Africa is not the color of our skin, it's because of the ideology that we carry and our organic identity. So Africa, Africa is the second most populous uh, continent on the surface of the heart currently, very, very rich. It has the biggest desert in the world, the Sahara Desert. Very, very full of and the most, the most genetically diverse continent on the surface of the heart. Me, that means Africa comprises of different kingdoms, different civilizations, different identities, people of disparate uh, ethnic views, and um, that abound on the African continent. So when people talk about Africa as a country, and they say, I'm going back to Africa. It is not just ignorance. It is a genocidal statement. It's an ethnocidal statement. It is a foolish statement that we should not overlook. And we should change that narrative as fast as possible. Because they are the, the and that is why the ideology of talking about one Africa or any other nonsense was be resisted by any people, by anybody that is well, that understands history. So the first contact, Africa has always been the whole world. And Africa has always had contact with other civilizations outside the geopolitical, uh, according to the geopolitical lands landscapes that we call continents. I'm saying this because when people say Europe is different from Asia, that is not true. Because Europe and Asia, they have contiguous land border. So it makes no sense very funny. When you call, when you say Europe and Asia is different, what we can say is that the people that live in that, on that continent are different. You look like countries like Russia, is it a European country or an, or an Asian country? 
You look like countries like Turkey. Is it a European country or an Asian country? You look like country like Azerbaijan. You look at countries like Georgia. That's why that is why it is a it is it is on, on it's when we are when we understand this properly, when we understand the way the semantics of the world, we will not be rigmarole to fight other people's battle. We will not be integrated to build other people's prosperity. We are not going to be politically correct in standing for who we are. And even though there are a lot of our brothers and sisters that have been damaged with beyond remedy, that will fight us for fighting for what we believe in, we must understand one fundamental fact that at the end of the day, we shall overcome. In the 15th century, the Portuguese were the first people who came from, who came from Europe and they started making, exploring Africa. And when they first came, they came as traders, economists. They came to trade with us. Don't forget that statement I just made, trade, trade, trade. Trade is extremely, extremely important. Do not be fooled when people say we are just here for economics. That is why some people are raising alarm about what China is doing. For you to first be colonized, your economic power must be taken away from you. So when they came, they came to trade. Firstly, they were taking buying ivories, they were buying rubbers, they were buying spices, they were buying leathers from the shores of Africa. That is why ancient African empires, like the Bini Empire, the Oyo Empire, the Ghana Empire, Shanti Empire, you know, traded, traded the Jebu kingdoms, traded the Congo Empire traded with the Portuguese. And um, by the end of the end of the 15th century, the Portuguese, they started, they, they got forced their strong foothold. And, um, and that was how they were able to penetrate Congo. When they penetrated Congo, um, the, the king of Congo, you know, indigenous king of Congo empire, you know, they, they, they meet, they, what they requested from the Congo was that Congo should supply them with slaves and they supplied the Congo with guns. At, of, at, of, at, of, at first, uh, a lot of Portuguese uh, teachers, the they teachers, technocrats, engineers, they settled in Congo and they were doing a good job ensuring that the Congolese people you know, through the, the, they started learning uh, Portuguese language, and even the King of Congo himself converted into Christianity. But later on, the dynamics of power changed. If you understand the way colonialism works, those who want to colonize you will not come at first and tell you, we want to colonize you. It's surely going to start gradually. It starts little by little. It doesn't start at first. They tell you, oh, we are just here to trade. We are just here to do business. Later on, they'll start participating in your politics. They'll start determining who becomes, who becomes the kings, just like they did in Lagos. And don't forget, Lagos was first, it, it, it was the Portuguese people who first gave Lagos, Lagos. They, first, they, they, they called like, that, um, the name Lagos was a Portuguese word. The same thing, you go to Guinea. Guinea was a Portuguese word. So across Cameroon. So a lot of the, a lot, you go to places like Escravos. Escravos is nothing but slave coasts. All those places along, that is why you see the entire West African coast. It was called the slave coast because they were taking the human resources, human capital to build the new world. And uh, many people have asked this question. Why didn't the Europeans penetrate Africa just the way they penetrated the New World? I'm talking about uh, Australia, Australasia. I'm talking about, some people call it Oceania. When I mean the, um, uh, majorly uh, New Zealand, uh, Australia, Fiji, and Solomon Islands, and other uh, islands that uh, surround um, those countries. And um, um, some people also talk about um, North America and South America. Why were the Europeans not as uh, effective in the decimation of the indigenous people 
of uh, Africa, most especially West, Central, East, and South Africa, like the way they did for the new for the for for, for the people in um, in North America, for the people in South America, and for the people of Australia. What happened? What stopped them? Were we just lucky? Some people might say, "Oh, it was just God." You know, our people are very, very esoteric and our people are very, very religious. So I'm not going to blame them for being that. But the reality it was, it was just nature. We were just lucky. Firstly, it was malaria. Malaria prevented the Europeans from circling in Africa and taking over the European, and taking over Africa as it is. So they, so they, they and, and, and that really stopped them. They could not enforce secular colonialism in mass in the 17th, 18th, 19th century. Also, the uh, sophistication of the of the weapons that that was present in the 19th, in the 16th, 17th, 18th century, could not outgun and outmatch the cavalry uh, warfare. That uh, cavalry warfare and uh, the use of bow arrow, sword, that indigenous African kingdoms and civilizations have also mastered. So that is why, for instance, when you look at a particular battle that happened at the Battle of Atapami, the battle between the Ashanti Empire and the Oyo Empire, the people, the battle that happened in the mid, uh, in the mid uh, 18th century, the Battle of Atapami, the Ashanti Empire was armed with a lot of muskets I'm talking about um, these the guns from the Portuguese, from the Europeans, but uh, your empire had one of the greatest, uh, had one of the greatest cavalry warfare, uh, uh, cavalry forces in West Africa at this point in time. In fact, at the time at the time of Alafi Oropunto, the only female Alafi of the your empire, the your empire had close to one hundred thousand uh, cavalry to call upon for war. At any point in time, that's could this could rival many European army. It could rival the if I it could rival the Roman Empire army. It could rival a lot of uh, a lot of uh, civilizations in the world at that time. It was just a remarkable. Feat. But the Oyo army, using their cavalry uh, forces, were able to defeat the Ashanti army that was even used. They were even using guns because many of the guns during this time were not deadly. They were not accurate and and the cavalry warfare. So this balance of terror and this balance of power changed in the 19th century with the massive industrialization that took place in Europe. The first industrialization of, of Europe that took place was built on the extermination of the people of North America and South America. So the resources that Europeans were able to get from those continents at the back of the indigenous people was what was used to build um, the build the first uh, uh, industrial revolution, and after this time, the Europeans were able to build a lot of. Uh, they invented a lot of weapons, weapons like the magazine guns, you know, machine guns. You know, this gave them this undue advantage, and this was what uh, I can say was the beginning of the end for indigenous people of Africa. So. Um, I'm going to now concentrate majorly on, um, on uh, I'll also talk about what happened in South Africa, because uh, many people don't know that uh, uh, South Africa is a terrible situation, southern part of Africa. And uh, I have told a lot of people, there is nothing called one Africa. It doesn't exist. We shouldn't deceive ourselves. Um, a lot of our different parts of Africa have evolved into different, morphed into different sociological uh, ideology, they've moved into a different sociological reality. So if you've, if you've not saved yourself yet, so why should you be thinking you are going to be the Jesus or the Messiah of other people that have decided to be happy with secular colonialism, to be happy with the, the, the destruction of indigenous people? Now, firstly, there is, uh, I want to talk about the British. So the British uh, people, they did themselves, um, apart from terrorizing indigenous people across Afri uh, Africa and the world, they were also good at stealing colonies from other, from other uh, European countries. So the Cape of Good Hope 
uh, now in South Africa, call it, people call it Cape Town. So that area of South Africa used to be the only route. If you are the shipping route from Europe and you are America and you want to go to uh, India or you want to go to Indonesia, you want to go to Asia, so you have to sail around that Cape of Good Hope in uh, down, down south in Southern Africa. So that is what you have to do. So the Dutch, because at the point in time, the Dutch were the most powerful maritime uh, power country on the surface of the heart. And that is why when pe some people are not, some people ate capitalism, when some people ate uh, multinational corporations, you can, I understand where they are coming from. It is because um, colonialism was not done, was a private venture. So after the private venture, after the, and the, the reason why European countries and these superpowers, the reason why they used the private venture to, to, do, to engage in colonialism was that the private venture, the, the, you cannot accuse them of human rights abuse. They can wipe out as many people as possible. They can kill, they can destroy, and they can get away with impunity. So that was what was done. Uh, that was the basis of... Um, of using private uh, companies, private companies like uh, uh, Royal Niger Company, Royal East Indian Company, the Dutch East Indian Company. So the Dutch East Indian Company, I'm talking about land. Uh, uh, so were the ones who created the, the the settlement that we have in South Africa. So when they created it, and it was so prosperous. A lot of uh, Dutch people from Holland came there and they settled in South Africa. So the indigenous people that were found there were the Khoi Khoi people. They were literally uh, exterminated via slavery. Um, they were driven into extinction. A lot of people, slaves were brought from Mozambique. So that's part of, when you talk about South Africa, South Africa from its beginning to this current moment was built on genocide of the indigenous people. It was a destruction of the indigenous people. And um, it was just a miracle that the people were able to survive one way or the other. So um, the, the British, during the Napoleonic War, were um, fought against other Euro another European. I'm talking about the Boers. Took Cape of for them. You know, Europe, what the Britain does is look at juicy trade route and the what they do fight dirty and get and 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 and, uh, and take it away from the indigenous people um, let me tell you something the world is built on genocide brothers and sisters the world is built, is built on genocide the world is not built on your niceties your but the world is not built on your on your on your on your ignorance your, 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 your the world is not built on you being a gentleman or a gentle lady if you, are, if you are not ready to fight for your sovereignty, the land you think belongs to your forefathers can be taken away from you. If a superior force comes and takes you out, the world will move on. It will move on. There's, the world has not changed. It is you that you changed, and you'll be taught a bitter lesson by people that understand the way of the world. The world has not changed. It is built on secular colonialism. Just look at Australia. Look at Australia, for God's sake, in the middle of the Pacific. They created a white nation, which was, this was a country that was inhabited by black people for hundreds and even thousands and thousands of years. All of a sudden, they created a white nation from the scratch. What happened? We are the indigenous people. Look at North America. Look at and I'm not politically correct by your survival. It's, it's, it doesn't make sense. But let me go back to what we are discussing. So the, the Boas, the Boas, uh, which means farmers, uh, Dutch people, they were expelled from the Cape of Good, Good Hope, and the British took it over. So the Boers moved. So when the Boers moved, they trekked and went to go and create new two states, Transvaal and Orange Free, uh, Free States. Now, and uh, look at what the British did. The British said, okay, no problem. You've left them, you've, you've left that spot for us. You are free to go. So go and create your new Transvaal state and the Orange Free State. Immediately, Diamond was discovered in Transvaal and Orange Free State. Do you know what the British did again? They invaded. They invaded Transvaal and Orange Free State and incorporated, incorporated, incorporated it 
into the German, into the British Empire. So it's still the same. So when you understand the way this works, British European imperialism is not just uh, Europe, white people and other indigenous people. White on white imperialism, white on white genocide, white on white uh, 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 extermination. So what about you? You are just, and you don't, even have the, you don't even belong to the same race as them. So you have to understand the way colonialism works. It's all about dominance. It's all about resources. It's all about exploitation. It's all about destroying others in order to build your prosperity. It has not changed. It has not changed. And it will never change, except you want to deceive yourself. So a lot of, so that was how, uh, 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 Britain hijacked South Africa from the Dutch, you know, and um, the black people were not even, you know, the Zulus and co, they don't even have a say, you know, they were just being killed, you know, like cows, you know, let me just leave that. So you look at Namibia, so the Germans literally wiped out almost 70% uh, of the people there to, 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 to take over the land. Uh, or should I talk about the atrocities of, uh, of uh, King Leopold II? King Leopold II was the one um, who actually made a lot of Europeans to, to become so interested in Africa. So a lot of European countries decided because of the difficulties in, in, in uh, penetrating Africa, they could not, because number one, they could not penetrate easily from the north because there were Arabs and they, they were, they were, they were, we, had, we had the Ottoman Empire. I also want to give you an, another example of what the British did. Um, in 1869, the Suez Canal was, was, uh, was, uh, uh, was, was being built. So, and um, the, you see, immediately the Suez Canal building started, the British knew that the land they stole, the area they stole from the, from the, uh, from the Dutch, in South Africa was becoming was going to become useless because nobody was going to no trading route, no trading passage was going to be frequent, was going to occur along the along the Cape of Good Hope again. So because passing through the Suez Canal was faster, was cheaper, and was more economical. So um, the British went to went to work again. So and when they went to work, they wanted to take the they had to take over the Suez Canal from, 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 the, from the Arabs. So even though the Arabs also, they, 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 when Egypt never belonged to them, they also stole it from the Kushite, from the indigenous people. You, have, you can see the way the world works. So people get to a space, they kick the indigenous people out. After some time, another people comes, they kick you out. So you have to understand that that very land you are in, in Yoruba land, in Igbo land, in Ijo land, you are a temporary occupant. If you don't have the means to protect it, if you don't have the, the violence to defend it, if you don't have the power to defend it, you are not going to be nice when you defend your land. When you are nice when you defend your land, you are going to go extinct. When you are nice when you defend your space, you are going to go extinct. When people tell you you are a tribalist for saying you want to defend your space, you are a fool. I'm sorry to use that word. You must defend your space. That is the way of the world. That is geopolitics. That is the way the world was built on. So by 1882, Britain fought another brutal war and stole the Suez Canal from the indigenous people. They stole it. They occupied it. Just the way the Americans also took over Panama Canal. It's the same. That is the way the Anglo-Saxon work. When people talk about democracy, the, 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 the influence of democracy around the world is not, is not because democracy is beautiful. Democracy was enforced on everybody in order through guns and ammunition. Democracy was enforced on everybody through guns and ammunition. Western democracy as it is, because they did not teach us democracy. I'm very, very sure if by before 1960, the British supported sex-sex sex, sex marriage. Nigeria would have been would have been practicing sex-sex marriage since 1960, and a lot of our people will be at the forefront because they are children of Lugard, they are children of colonialism and children of imperialism. 
The reason why a lot of our people are saying, oh, they don't want this, they don't, they, they are still fighting against LGBT was because the Europeans left early before they before they accepted, before the Europeans themselves accepted same-sex marriage. So that is colonialism. It distorts the way you view the world. It distorts, you live in a fantasy land, you live in a la-la land. When people tell you your history, you hate it. In a bid to, to hide under humanity, you yourself become a mini colonialist. That is the under, that is the definition, that is the that is the reality of, of Nigeria of, 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 of colonialism. So let's now uh, I've talked about a uh, paraphrase a lot of events that was happening. And I shouldn't I shouldn't I should also tell you this. Also in the 19th century and 1950. European France invaded Algeria, took it away from the indigenous people, and they instituted a secular colony. And they had a lot of problem understanding Africa. So they embraced three diplomatic efforts. Now, let me tell you something. The conquest of Africa by the European powers was not just through the barrel of the gun. It was a two-dimensional approach. It was carrot and stick approach. Now let's talk. I've talked about the the stick, which are the use of gun, guns, development of advanced machine guns. Now let's talk about the the the, the carrot. The carrot was that they ensured that um, they the, the Europeans ensured that they Christianized Africa, they Anglicized Africa, and I'm going to go there later and talk about it extensively. And another thing they did was they were now funding explorers, private investments. So when you hear private, we, are invite, we want private investors to come and invest in our land, you are inviting colonialism. So that is why one of the things the Europeans ate is when they hear an indigenous uh, leader talking about nationalizing uh, private companies. Start seeing yourself, why are they afraid of this? Because when you nationalize an indigenized your means of production, your wealth, you are destroying colonialism. And many of our people don't know. And we are going to have it. And that is why they train a lot of bourgeoisie uh, economists. They train a lot of bourgeoisie technocrats that go about and say, oh, um, nationalization does not work. And they start giving examples of how nationalizations do not work in order to scare the other house Negroes not to fight for their freedom. But I'm not here to talk about economics. We're here to talk about the commemoration of the 1884 Berlin West African Conference that started 138 years ago, November 15, to be specific, in Berlin. That's why we're here. And we are going to have that discussion. That's why it's not a, this conversation is not a discussion where we are going to be brutal to each other. We, we have to have this conversation intellectually, calmly, as much as possible. So, um, going back to, I, so I said, France invaded Algeria. So they, 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 were, they were just looking for ways to penetrate Africa. So check, check your info, sir. Here on Twitter. So they, they, so they, so they, so they wanted to, they wanted to penetrate Africa. The other thing I also want to talk about is, uh, please, I have to, I'm going to wrap up in 20 minutes. Because we need to, I need to talk about uh, the conference proper. So I have to give this prelude so that people can know where we are coming. Before the 1884 Berlin West African Conference, Europeans only controlled 20% of Africa because it was chaotic. So a lot of explorers were, were, were funded in order to map out Africa. So many of the missionaries, Christian missionaries that were going across Africa, Many of them were not just missionaries alone. They were making notes. They were explorers to draw maps of rivers in Africa. Naturally, Africa, uh, God, nature had fortified Africa so that Africa will not be, Africans will not be exterminated. Our rivers are not easily navigable. So it is very, very difficult for somebody to just be going through the river and moving from one place to the other. So it made it difficult for us to be penetrated. And it preserved a lot of our people. If not, it could have been many places in Africa would have, would have what you are going to see are going to be white faces. 
and there's nothing you're going to do about it. You're going to move on. If there are many of you in this room, you are going to be supporting it. And when people like us are talking, you are going to be fighting us. Because that is what is happening. So, um, and in, so out of Bismarck, the statesman, a German statesman that created the German uh, country, Germany did not exist 300 years ago. Brothers and sisters, you need to understand this. Germany was created by Otto von Bismarck. So what we had was different German states, German-speaking people in different kingdoms who created Germany. So when some, when some uh, unfortunate people go about and telling you Yoruba people are never united before. Tell them that, what, 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 did, we, did we have anything called Germany? Did we have anything called Germany? So you have to understand, you know, that nation building, nation state is not a static situation. It evolves. And Jam, uh, out of Bismarck was one of the people who proposed that for peace to reign in Europe, Europe must be built along ethno-linguistic lines that the German-speaking people should be in the German country. The French-speaking people should be in the French country. The Hungarian-speaking people should be in an Hungarian country. The Romanian-speaking people, speaking people must be in a Romanian country. You do, because during the period of 19th century, it was a period of empire, full-blown empire by the European powers. Everything, the, the, everything you see that the European powers were doing in Africa, they already did it on themselves. They've killed themselves. They've mastered the act of self-preservation. That is why they became ruthless and they are so effective in what they do, unlike us. Now, and they gave us education for us to just function in their system, not for us to challenge their system. So many of our people that challenge their system, they do it wrongly. They don't even understand what they're fighting for. And when you fight for the wrong cause, it's like not fighting at all. When you fight for the wrong cause, it's like not fighting at all. That's it. Because you are going to die for the wrong cause and your names will not be written in the sense of time. So um, Belgium, Belgium was the most successful. Belgium was so rich that every other European countries were asking questions. Where is Belgium getting its wealth? Belgium was getting its wealth through the exploitation and total de de degradation and destruction of the indigenous people. So Belgium took over uh, 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 the area called Congo. And within the space of 20 years of the colonization of Congo, 80% of the indigenous people in that area called Congo were wiped out. 80%. So when people talk about genocide, we've been the people that have suffered and suffered and suffered a lot. But it's something very, very, there's something common to the black man. A black man is, 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 is the one that goes about saying, let us forgive, let us forgive, let us forgive. That is a characteristic of a messed up, a conquered, and a destroyed individual. People will preach in the, people will preach forgiveness without justice. That is the definition of a black man. Who goes about looking for people to love him? A Yoruba man goes about looking for Igbos to love him, looking for Yahusa to love him, looking for Fulani to love him, looking for Igede people to love him, looking for Ashanti people to love him, going looking for Madinka people to love him. And this same Yoruba man is not even interested in loving his fellow Yoruba man. Because he has been Christianized, he should love the whole world without loving himself. Even the Christian Bible you read tells you that love your neighbor as you love yourself. You've not loved yourself, you want to love your neighbor. So when we preach self-preservation to such people, it seems like we are preaching hatred. Same thing happens to the Igbo man, same thing happens to the Igbo man. So in German, your fellow in German means tra is trash to you, but the man from Kanuri is your brother. Because those are the resultant effect of the, of the Berlin West African Conference. In the Berlin West African Conference that happened in, 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 in Germany, 14 European countries took place. Russia, Sweden, Austria, many of these countries were just there to observe. Ottoman Empire was also there. 
because they had a stake in Africa. Now, let me not tell you some funny things. Some Arab sultans also wanted to participate in the, in, the, in, the, in the Berlin West African Conference. And I'm going to give you a good example that is well written down in history. It was the Sultan of Zanzibar. You know, the Arabs also see themselves as superior to black people. And they see themselves as also in the same level as the Europeans. So the Sultan of Zanzibar also wanted to participate in the Berlin West African Conference. He was kicked out. That we is he. That is inferior. Because I'm talking about the, when we talk about the 19th century, the Ottoman Empire was, they were the biggest in the world. It was after the First World War and the disintegration of the Ottoman Empire that Arab denunciation started. It was what the Europeans just did in order to punish the Ottoman Empire for participating in the First World War on the side of Germany. What they did was just to prop up Arabs, the Arab world, and made them look as the preserver and custodian of Islam in order to, in order to punish Turkey. You have to understand this history. You have to understand what is going on. So in the conference, it was built on three things. One, one of the memo that was released on the conference was this. It's a summary. The sovereignty, sovereignty of the kingdoms and empires of the indigenous African nations of Africa must not be respected. Two, the new borders that were drawn by Europeans must be, be eternal and must be the economic post, the economic reality in which Africa will be governed for as long as possible. Three, Africa, the natives must be Christianized in order to ensure that the legacies of colonialism is permanent because they've learned they were looking at what their experiences in India. The reason why India is still has been able to still fighting back against India and China have been able to fight back and become one of the become superpowers currently is because India, the Europeans find it very difficult to Christianize India and Anglicize India and China. If India and China and even Japan had been properly westernized and Christianized, there, is, there will never be any form of indigenous civilization in those places. So what you have half is a form of uh, Western civilization parading itself as indigenous civilizations. You have to understand this, that the world is built on the clash of cultures, the world is built on the clash of civilizations. And when two cultures two different ideology and when two different beliefs occupy the same space. It's a matter of time before one is destroyed and the one, other one triumphs. It's the same with you. It doesn't, it's, 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 it's not a matter of, it's not mathematics. So when we talk about Nigeria, and some people say unity in diversity, let us just, just continue. It's a matter of time before the, before the ethnic minorities in, in Nigeria, many of them will go extinct. It's not a lie. Go and look at the Jere people. Where are they? A lot of ethnic nationalities have gone extinct. They've been assimilated into other ethnic groups. It is it's a form of genocide. We have to have we have to have this conversation. Or look at the way Abuja was created. Abuja was built on genocide. Indigenous people driven out of their homes, taken out of their spaces. And other ethnic nationalities were settled in that place in order to build Nigeria. Abuja was built on genocide, on secular colonialism, in order to build the capital of Nigeria. And when we talk, that's why we say Nigeria is genocide. It's a genocidal country built on genocide. It has no respect for indigenous people. So for you to be a good Nigeria, you yourself will have no single respect for indigenous people. It's a symptom, it's a symptom. Unconsciously, people that believe in Nigeria, they continue to behave that way because they are children of Lord Lugat. So 
I told you three things was done, was agreed on in the, in the Berlin West African Conference. Christianize Africa, destruction of indigenous civilization, sovereignty of indigenous people must not be, must not be respected. After the 1884 Africa, Berlin West African Conference, by 1914, Africa, 90% of Africa was controlled by Europeans. 90% in the space of 30 years after that conference. Because they became more organized. Because before, what the Africans were doing was if the, if the Europeans, if the Europeans were, uh, for instance, if the British were attacking you, African uh, chiefs, African kings, African others, Af sultans in Africa could go to the Portuguese and get guns or go to the Spanish to get guns. If the Portuguese were attacking you, you could go to the French for help to get advanced weapons. If the, uh, uh, if the Belgium were attacking you, you could go to the Dutch to get weapons. After that conference, it became a law that if Britain was attacking an indigenous space, they, no Afri they, they must, no European country must assist that Europeans, uh, must assist that African country. It was just a bully. It was a meeting of bullies, the Berlin West African Conference. Now, the irony is this, brothers and sisters, you have to listen to this. Otto von Bismarck, who was preaching ethno-linguistic homogeneous model that Germans should rule Germans, French should rule French, British should rule British, uh, English should rule English rather, um, uh, Russians should rule Russians. In Europe, when it came to the issue of Africa, did not provide a solution. It instead they created made they created false countries. They created monsters. And because they have no single respect for us, they don't even want to know who we are. Because they believe we are nobodies. We are nobody. And that is how you became a Nigerian. So after that Berlin conference, through coercion, through guns, they came in full, full, full blown. That's why the Yoruba, we Yoruba people still remember the Battle of Imagbo where thousands of Ijebu soldiers were killed because the British wanted to take up what they've done. Now, let me tell you what happened to the Yoruba people. At the Berlin West African Conference, Yoruba land was broken fundamentally, majorly into three spaces. They divided Yoruba land into three. So when we talk about Yoruba land, Yoruba land is not Nigeria. There's Yoruba land of Togo. There is Yoruba land of Benin Republic. There's Yoruba land of Nigeria. So they balkanized Yoruba land into three. And three European superpowers took up different parts of Yoruba land. The Germans took the Yoruba land of Togo. They called it German Togo land. And the Yoruba people there became Togolese. The French took the Yoruba people of Benin Republic. Then it was called Dahomey. And they became Beninua. The British took the largest portion, which is the Yoruba land of Nigeria. Don't forget that at a point in time, the French were also looking for how to take places like Abe Okuta Okyogun to be part of Ijai, to be part of um, Benin Republic, French domination. So in order to stop this, the British did something disingenuous, something deceptive. They gave the Egba Kingdom a form of they gave the Egba Kingdom a form of freedom. And Egba was a sovereign country until 1918, before after the Adobe War. Before the European, before the before the English did what they did to the Boers, to the Egba people. The British will give you a form of freedom. After they've been able to destroy you, they've, they've been able to use you to destroy your other competitors, they will come for you. They have no permanent friends. They don't keep their words. They've never kept their words. They have never kept their words. And it's so surprising 
These are the people that are my people think are going to give them freedom. These are the people my people think they should copy. These are the people that our people think mean well for us. These are the people my people think we shouldn't criticize. Many of them are in the audience. Anytime you criticize their colonial masters, they start saying, leave the British out of this, leave the French out of this. Insane people. I said, I'm not going to be that harsh. But sometimes you have to wonder what is wrong with them. They are not going to listen. They are still going to leave this space to go and be writing nonsense on their Twitter spaces. They are still going to be running after illusions. They are still going to be thinking that a Messiah is coming to give them 24 hour electricity. Powerful people build strong institutions. It is only failed people that believe in strong men. We can see examples around us. So that was what happened. Battle of Imagma, for instance. Oyo was also bombed by the British. People don't know this. In 1895, Oyo was bombed in order to force the Allah to force the Treaty of Amalgamation. They bombed Oyo. So you are in Nigeria by genocide. You must never forget that in your head. No matter any nonsense, any pastor, any, any uh, imam, any, any uh, motivational speaker that teaches you to perspire, to aspire, inspire, to perspire, aspire, to inspire nonsense, no matter what they teach you, you must never forget that. So that was, in summary, what led to the Berlin West African Conference and what happened? So when you look at people like uh, Mungo Park, they would change history and say Mungo Park discovered River Niger. Mungo Park was nothing but a mole. He was mapping out territories, drawing out ma ma uh, boundaries, talking about the indigenous people that occupy each of spaces. It was those data that helped the Europeans in the conquest of Sub-Saharan Africa. And when you look at history, you read a lot of history, and the way they paint these explorers as if they are doing us a good, doing us good. We don't even know that they were the people who sold us out. We don't even understand this fact. If you don't understand your problem, you have no solutions. That is why this history is very, very important. And that is, well, that is what happened to the Yoruba people. The Yoruba man is told to see the Yoruba man in Benin Republic as a foreigner. They see an Awusa man from Kano as a brother. That is what fella called teacher don't teach me nonsense. We need to talk, we need, we need to say the way it is. Why are, you, why are we purposefully miseducating our youths? And many of them have become nuisance on Twitter, running after illusions, risking their lives for nothing, cashing out on rubbish. And they are even part of those who rubbish the Yoruba identity that some people fought, died in their millions to protect. We fought against the, the we fought against the Fulanese, the Sahelians, from taking over our territory in 1940. 1812, 1876, fought in the Polar Wars in the 1830s, fought at the Ledway War also in the 1830s. We fought the British at the Magma War. We fought everywhere. The Egbert people, Yoruba Egbert people fought against the Dalmes. It's all about built, was built on blood. Our identity was built on blood. The Yoruba identity was built on blood. The sacrifice of our hero past. That is the sacrifice of your hero past. Maybe it was 300, 400, 500 years ago. Some people paid the supreme price to protect that identity that you now use for clout on Twitter. They fought for it. That is why we tell rich people. Now, this is where I'm going. The 2023 election is a waste of time. It was a distraction. We want. We want it was going to lead to the opening of old wounds. What has been said? Ethnicities have been ridiculed. 
Even those who want who are shouting one Nigeria, you see them abusing other ethnicities because you want political power. I'm not talking about any any group, all groups. So you should know something is fundamentally wrong in Nigeria. The 2023 election is a war. It's a war in which ethnicity, which civilization, is it the Islamic civilization? Is it the Yoruba civilization? In which, is it the Fulani civilization? In which the full Igbo civilization is going to get resources and power? Anybody who tells you it's an elite thing, you are lying to yourself. You have to understand that ethnicity, tribe, is what is the hegemony on which the world is built on. Haven't you seen other civilizations? You've seen Putin talk about Anglo-Saxon civilization. Anglo-Saxon means German. Those are a German, they are Germanic people. US was built on civil or Anglo-Saxon civilization. You don't need to belong to a particular race genetically before you also become part of that civilization by assimilation. Yoruba people built empire. So I understand this. There are many people of Nupe origin 300, 400 years ago that are now part of Yoruba civilization. There are many people of Bariba origin 300, 300 years ago that are now part of Yoruba civilization. So don't fool yourself. We have to understand the way the world works. Failure to do it, we are going to be colonized again. This time we are not going to survive it. They will wipe us out. That is why we tell you Nigeria is not going to save you. What is Nigeria? It means nothing. It's a territory of the British. Why do you think no European country wants a change in the borders of Africa? Not a single one. Not a single one. You have to understand that you cannot beat them at this game. Today should be a day of money. Today should be a day of tears for all, Indi for all indigenous people of Africa. Today should be a day everybody should be weeping. And we should sing that Jewish song by the rivers of Babylon. Why we sat down? Here yeah, we wept when we remember Zion. We should remember. Today was the day our destiny was sealed. The day was the day we lost who we are. Today is a day of tears for each and every one of us. Today should not be a day. That is why I say our people are damaged. They will say oh, we should be happy that today was the day that um, uh, 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 Berlin West African Conference happened. Thank God for Nigeria. You are damaged. You are damaged. Today was the day your sovereignty was taken away from you. Today was the day you became a fourth class citizen of the world. Today was the day your civilization became inferior. Today was the day that you became a U.S. of woods and drawers of waters for other civilization. Today was the day that colonialism was legalized. Today was the day that Yoruba became a vernacular. I'm talking and speaking from the Yoruba as a Yoruba man until we all have a day to sit down. That is why you say the African Union, the African Union is a, is, is a union that was built to maintain the Berlin West African Conference. That is why some of us don't want Pan-Africanism, all those people that preach this nonsense, Pan-Africanism that does not respect indigenous people, not to get close to what we are discussing because they are working for the colonialists. Anybody who tells you that 1884 Berlin West African borders should be maintained is your enemy. Do not take them serious. They are your enemies. They are as dangerous as any as they are as dangerous as the colonial looters, colonialists, and they are as dangerous as the slave masters. They are as dangerous as any politician you hate. Anybody who tells you the 1884 Berlin West African conference, the borders should be maintained. Anybody who tells you ethnicity does not matter is your enemy. Anybody who compares indigenous lands and kingdoms in Africa to, a place, to places like 
America, USA, where the indigenous people were wiped out. It's your enemy. It's because we lack the wisdom to tackle these monsters. That is why they go about spreading this nonsense. War is coming to Africa. Because Africa is the resources that sustains the world. And the Anglo-Saxon civilization is trying to maintain its stance. So what China is doing is what the Europeans have done. It's what the Europeans have done. Coming through trade to take over our space. So the world is a multipolar world currently. It is never a, uni it's never a unipolar world anymore. People have the choices to make. It's a multipolar world out there. And if we choose the wrong side, we are going to be destroyed. As an Igbo man listening to me today, a Yoruba man is not going to solve your problem. The Yoruba man is not going to solve your problem. As an Igbo man, as an Igbo man, you have to solve the Igbo problem yourself. As a Yoruba man, the Fulani man is not going to solve your problem. The Germans will never expect the French to solve the German problem. The English will never expect the Irish to solve the English problem. Even the United Kingdom, the Scots solved solve the Scots problem. The Welsh solve the Welsh problem. The Irish solve the Irish problem. Because you have to understand, when they say unity in diversity, it was a term used for Italians, not for a multi-ethnic, multi-civilization, multi-identical, identity country like nigeria shouldn't deceive ourselves shouldn't deceive ourselves this is a conversation that they are, you are not going to see on arise tv channels tv they are going to keep you distra distracted running after shadows giving platforms to bimbos to idiots we have to have this conversation the Ijob man will solve the Ijob problem. The Bini man will solve the Bini problem. The Efik man will solve the Efik problem. That is the definition of self-determination. We have to understand this. It's a multipolar world. The reason why the Europeans could do a lot of damage to the rest of us in the 19th century was because the world was unipolar. The world was unipolar. They were able to do a lot of damage and get away with it. That is why the Chinese talk about the 100 years of humiliation. How the Europeans humiliated them. That they will never allow that to happen again. When Britain literally went to, England, went to China, destroyed their army, destroyed their society, and forced their children to be smoking opium or heroin. And 50 to 60 percent of the people of China became heroin addicts. And the money that was Britain became so rich from selling drugs to the rest of the world. Most especially China, which was the biggest economy at that time, got destroyed. So when people say oh, India, China, oh, these are countries that we should copy. 300 years ago. 200, 300 years ago, China and India were the biggest economy in the world. These are civilizations that have existed for thousands of years. You can't compare them to colonial Lugardian, uh, Lugard liability limited like Nigeria. You should be comparing in China to, 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 to the Bini Kingdom or comparing China to the Yoruba civilization. Because those are civilization states. How do we even start when the young people that are supposed to lead this conversation don't even understand what they're talking about? And they even go on stages to, 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 no, to, make fun, to make a joke of themselves. That's why some of us are no longer tolerant and patient. Because there's a limit to stupidity. There's a limit to buffoonery. At this point, Thank everybody that has listened so far. 
I tried as much as possible not to bore us with a lot of historical jargons. As many of, we've spoken several times. And I don't think many people listen to a lot of history we talk about. They're just here, they're just on, 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 on platforms like this to catch crews. But we know we are going to be free. And not all Africa will be free. No this and no peace. Because you can see, as at early this year, your, maybe the early this year, last year, you see North Africa and the Middle East having what we call Arab Corp. This was a kind of sporting event between the Arab world. Are you going to stop them? It is their right. Because they have something in common, Arab civilization. Even though we knew North Africa was never Arab land, they took that land through genocide and bloodshed. But that is the way the world is built. I respect the Palestinian cause. But before I'm going to join the Palestinian cause, I want every Arab to also denounce how they conquered, what they are doing in Darfur, and the destruction of the people, or indigenous people in Mauritania, the black slavery going on in Mauritania. He who comes to a quitty must come with clean hands. This is the kind of conversation and conversation we need to have. Thank you, everybody, once again. I'm going to go back to the co host to continue with the moderation. Are you there, the co host? Thank you.